Welcome to episode 2 of the Deepfakes tutorial series. This tutorial assumes that you have a basic understanding of the deepfakes process. If you are new to deepfaking, I highly recommend checking out the beginner's guide in episode 1, linked in the description. In this episode, we look at how to build and analyze our datasets to give us a solid foundation for training. If you enjoy this tutorial and would like early access to subsequent episodes, consider checking out the Patreon, linked in the description. The very first step to creating a good dataset is understanding what sort of destination video to choose. Let's look at our default data underscore DST video and analyze the suitability. The overall quality is acceptable, though obviously not fantastic. There is some blurring, in this case due to the movement of the subject rather than the camera. Ideally you would have a video of at least 720p and 24 frames per second. This is, of course, the lowest you should aim for. This scale helps us to identify good shots. In this case, we have a medium shot of our subject. The ideal shots for deepfaking are between a 3 and a 5. Too close and the trained face will be blurry. Too far and the face may not be detected at all. When analyzing a destination video, make a mental note of where the camera is in relation to your subject and how your subject is situated within the frame. In longer clips, with varying shot angles, this will become more complex. In this example, the camera is at approximately chest height. The subject does not move significantly towards or away from the camera, though does move perpendicular to it and rotates his head, giving us front-facing shots, profile shots and everything in between. The face moves up and down slightly within the frame. Notice the hand obstructing the face. In this section of the video, it only lasts for a few frames. This is not ideal but we can work around this in this particular situation. The subject's beard is unlikely to be a significant issue, though some clarity will likely be lost in the final result. Glasses may cause some problems depending on their size and properties. Beginners should avoid faces with glasses for now. The idea is to be able to match our second dataset to these shots as much as possible. It is personal preference as to whether or not you add further training data to your destination dataset. Personally, I believe a greater likeness is achieved when only the desired output frames are trained. Test this yourself to see which style you prefer. Now that we have looked at possible problems or concerns with our destination video and decided to continue on, we must extract the faces. As of January 2019, DFL comes with two options, DLib and MT. DLib has the benefit of producing fewer false positives, whereas MT has the benefit of better overall detection at the cost of more false positives. Let's try both and look at the results. Both methods have found the same number of images, however MT has detected more faces. To understand what these extra detections mean, we need to go and check the images manually. Remember, these images are within the aligned folder within our data underscore DST. DLib has fewer false positives, although a few are still present. False positives include anything that isn't the desired face, rotated properly as per the original footage. These false positives often have file names ending with a number of 1 or greater, especially in a scenario such as this, where we only have one subject within the frame. The numbers in the file name prior to the underscore show the frame in which the face or false positives were detected. The number following the underscore shows the number of the face within that specific frame. In the case of a shot with a crowd, this number may be significantly higher than a 0 or 1. In this example, any file name not ending in a zero should be inspected and removed if it does not correspond to our subject's face. False positives should be deleted. With a short destination video such as this, it may be easiest to simply go through the images in the folder and delete one file at a time. For longer clips, or clips with multiple faces, it will likely be faster to use some of the tools available in DFL. 
Sorting by histogram is very useful, especially when working with multiple faces in a frame. In this example, our extracted dataset contains two faces. If we only wanted John Cena, it would be slow work to delete the unwanted frames of Matthew McConaughey. Here we run sort by similar histogram, making sure we run the DST version. This is the dataset after sorting by histogram. The faces are now bulked together and can be easily managed. You must make a choice as to whether or not you train using blurred and obstructed faces. A good rule of thumb is to train with them assuming they make up less than 10% of your dataset. More than this and the likeness of your final product will suffer. If blurred and obstructed faces make up more than 50% of your dataset, get a new dataset. Sorting by blur is useful for checking this. Now that we have our DST dataset, we must move on to collecting and tailoring our SRC set. Forming a SRC dataset based specifically on the DST is called a targeted SRC. If you plan on using the SRC subject again for more footage in the future, you may want to create a broader dataset, called a generic SRC. As we are only using a single short scene as our DST, we will be creating a targeted SRC. As we don't have extreme angles or lighting, we can focus on just collecting quality front and side facing shots. Collect the data in your preferred way. I like to use multiple videos and still images. Unlike with DST, your SRC dataset should not contain any blurring or obstructions. The quality should absolutely be as high as possible. The only exceptions to this are hard to find angles that are necessary for certain DST videos if you cannot find a quality source. In that case, something is better than nothing. As this is a targeted SRC, we only need the angles associated with our DST. This means our SRC dataset is relatively small at only 665 images. Contrary to popular belief, you do not need thousands upon thousands of images in a dataset to create a good quality fake. Generic SRCs, however, will be much larger to cover all possible angles and expressions. Try making sure your SRC subjects' photos or videos are from approximately the same era. One person may look very different at 20 years old compared to 50 years old for example. Again, rare angles may be an exception. Once both of our datasets are complete, we begin the training. Keep an eye on the preview window and see what shots are working and which ones are not. If a certain angle is substandard, try to understand why. It may be an issue with the face detection or the model you choose, but there is a good chance it is down to an inadequate SRC dataset. Sometimes you may find that the quality of the face in the preview window is very high, but lacks a true likeness to the SRC subject. This may be down to conflicting data, such as different ages or face shape due to weight gain etc. Try to streamline this data by altering your dataset. You can also try what I call, forcing the likeness. This involves training on a standard dataset for some time and then creating a tiny dataset of less than 20 images and carefully training on the pre-existing model for a short period of time. Again, the preview window is the only sure-fire way to tell when to do this and how long to do it for. Be aware, you may need to alter your batch size appropriately when doing this. It's also good practice to back up your model before attempting a forced likeness, in case things don't go to plan. Looking at our deepfaking triangle, we can see the relation of each aspect to our dataset creation. A high-quality dataset takes time to create. A longer duration will likely need more angles and expressions and therefore will also take time. This is another reason that targeted SRCs can be useful. Let's take a look at our H64 model at 30,000 epochs with a polished dataset. The clarity is good and the similarity is certainly not bad in the section of the face covered by H64. But how can we improve this? The next episode looks at training, including model types and their settings. Some models offer far greater coverage of the face and therefore improve the overall likeness. The best advice I can give for dataset creation is to treat it as a fluid process. 
you should not simply amass a vast dataset, train and convert. Go back and forth between your datasets and your training, altering and adjusting as required. Good luck, keep practicing. If you enjoyed this video please like and subscribe.